Hello, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Ernie De Los Santos, founder and faculty chair at Appeal Academy and creator of Top Gun Audit School. We are live on the March 4th, 2016 edition of Finally Friday. And I do want to thank you for choosing to spend your time with us here on Finally Friday. We are, let's see, well, if I can get the slideshow started again. Here we go. Okay, today's Finally Friday broadcast is sponsored by the Health Law Partners, providing solid advice and real solutions for healthcare business nationwide. And also by Recovery Analytics, Sharon Easterling's company. My co-host, she does auditing and education. She writes articles for AEMA, as you'll see a little bit later today, and she is committed to your success. Finally, Friday is now also sponsored by MedLinks Cost Containment. They are the makers of the Healthcare Audit Tracker. Visit ZeroDenials.com today and see how they can help you track audits and greatly reduce or even eliminate denials. Another sponsor is Aerolib Healthcare Solutions. That's Dr. Bahuja's firm, a patient-centered total quality management consulting firm. They are the makers of the Physician Advisor's Guide DVD, which is now also available on demand. And they now have a new learning management system, and you're going to get a brief glance of that later on in the show. And then finally, we're sponsored by the Council for Certification of Medical Auditors, the CCMA. They are the creators of the widely used Certified Medical Audit Specialist, or CMAS, certification. Okay, today we're going to continue our discussion. This is really kind of changing shape of revenue cycle uh, part two, uh, because we're talking about the continuing nightmare that is included with all the changes in the revenue cycle and revenue integrity. And this week, we're going to point at some new value-based payment models and what that means that you might not yet be thinking about. And I've got a, a picture there on the screen of the uh, how Medicaid is growing, even though there was a lot of resistance to it earlier. Uh, when the Affordable Care Act came out, but now that is growing and changing, and that is something uh, that we're going to talk about a little bit as we go through. Okay, so uh, before we go further there, let me go back to the website and show people, if you are not familiar with the room, but I imagine most of you are, uh, if you're not, you can go to appealacademy.com, scroll down to any page, and go down to this one with the green buttons, and if you click on that, it opens a page that will give you all the instructions on how to use the room. Different ways you can connect for the audio. You want to open the chat box, I highly advise that because we often have an active uh, chat room going. Uh, you can zoom in and out on the screen if I'm not zoomed in enough for you. You can also see a list of participants where you're listed at the top. If you point at you, then you can actually change your name, and you'll see that some people do, some people don't. So up to you, whatever you want to do there. Uh, I do want to tell everybody that the show is recorded, but the chat box is not. Uh, so there's no record of that for anything like Discovery or anything like that. And as a matter of fact, I don't even have a list of exactly who attends. Uh, so um, anyway, uh, I do ask everybody and remind everybody, please stay professional in chat box. We have a lot of different kinds of people with different jobs and everything in there, and please just stay professional in your comments. And of course, if you have any questions during the show, you can ask them or make comments at any time in the chat box, and my co-host and I will do our best to uh, to handle those uh, as we see them. So now, oh, and if you haven't gotten the handouts yet, if you go to appealacademy.com and then go to this week on Finally Friday from the main menu or from the links and the emails that I send out, you can scroll right down here to this blue box that's always there every week, and you can just fill in your email, and it gives you uh, a direct link to the handouts. Uh, if you have trouble with that, let me know in the chat box, and probably somebody can send it to you, or um, if need be, I will send it to you after the show. Okay, so let's get back to the slide presentation. If I get my computer to cooperate and my desk to cooperate, we'll get going here. All right, 
So last week we talked about, we had Jessica Gustafson from the Health All Partners here with us to help go over the Medicare Appellant Forum and in particular the new settlement conference facilitation uh, phase three, which is now about Part A claims. That conference, settlement conference facilitation, yeah, the SCF has uh, never before been handling Part A claims, but now it is, and that was a, one of the big uh, changes, uh, and we talked all about that last week. This week, uh, as I said, we're talking about the changing shape of provider revenue cycle. We're going to kind of kind of focus on three three big changes that are kind of happening. One is just what's going on with Medicaid all over the country, as I mentioned, and the fact that the value-based payment models are here. They're not coming, they're here. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. And then how the models are changing for primary care providers. And we're going to, we're going to talk about some things going on in states about that. It's not at the national level yet, as far as I know, uh, but it's happening uh, in different states. So the question is that we pose is, how are you preparing for this? Because there's a lot of things about these value-based payment models that you may not have considered yet how they affect your revenue cycle or revenue integrity. So we'll get into that. First of all, let's go through some of the news. Uh, I actually have a lot of news uh, this week because there's just been a lot of talk about it uh, all of a sudden. Uh, oh, and then one thing I wanted to show everybody first is I'm excited about this because there's a new learning management system. I've been working with Dr. Pahuja uh, at Aerolib. That's Deepak Pahuja. Uh, and he has a new learning management system that is designed for hospitals to be able to design their own curriculum. He can develop curriculum that is specifically for them, put it into a learning management system. Now, this just not means does not mean you just you know assign things to somebody uh, and then you know you don't know what they do. Well, as a matter of fact, let me pull up. I'm just going to show you very quickly. Here are some slides um, that he and I he was showing me the system. Uh, because it's brand new, okay, but we do have, uh, he has clients on it already. And the cool thing is that it is a true learning management system, okay? So there are self-paced modules. There are about different, you, they assign different skills that you go through when you complete a course. It shows that you completed it. Uh, if you want to be able to track uh, how your people are doing on it when you assign them a course, it, it tracks them, it, it gives them, you know, there's a, there's videos, there's writing, there's whatever you need, and then there's tracking of everything. And this is kind of what it looks like, and I'm just buzzing through this. But then there's badges about what people have completed. So it's not, it's not something that you just put out there and hope that people go to it. This thing lets you track everything. So that's, that's what that's about. I just, we'll talk about that more in the future because uh, he and I are working with some hospitals uh, with that kind of a system. Uh, and that's tied in with Top Gun Audit School and success stories that we've had with that. And that's a future show. Anyway, okay. Uh, next thing I wanted to go through was Sharon, uh, as uh, most of you know, she's a, a fellow of AHIMA. Um, and she is, uh, she writes a couple times a year, she has articles published in AHIMA. The Journal of Ahima, and this is the latest one she's had that just came out that was part of their newsletter. And I'm going to let uh, Sharon tell us about tell us about what you're talking about here. I mean, it, I think it was basically just kind of a idea that hey, the movement's here; it's happening now, right? Absolutely, Ernie. Um, I think you know what we do. Hello, everybody. Um, happy Friday. But what we do this year is really going to impact our future payments. And, and that's a little bit of what this article about is about. Um, CMS has a quality strategy, and they've been working towards individual goals. I think there's a list of four of them that they're working towards to ensure that we are treating patients with high quality, quality and reserving or reducing our costs at the same time and devising a way of measuring providers in doing so. So in this article, I'm just talking a little bit about looking out there at that quality strategy, applying that to what we're doing in our facilities from a strategic planning perspective, and making sure that we're making changes now. Because 
what we do now will impact our payments for 2018 and, of course, even 2017 when you start talking about risk adjustments. So this, this article talks a little bit about, you know, right now we're paid off the fee schedule, and that's changing. Not only are we going to be paid off the fee schedule, but we're also going to be pay, paid off of quality, which is included with the merit-based incentive payment system that's coming into play. We have MACRA, um, and we did a show about MACRA a couple of weeks ago. Um, that's the new do Medicare system that's incorporating PQRS, um, the merit-based incentive program, the physician value-based modifier. All those things are being bundled together. And so you'll have your fee-for-service payment for now at a, at a reduced rate, but on top of that, you're going to have the opportunity to get quality incentive payment. And that quality incentive payment is going to be based on how you perform. So if you're a provider that provides high quality at low cost, you're going to reap great benefit in that incentive. But if you're a provider that has high, low quality, and um, and I might have said that backwards just now, it's, it's high quality and low cost is, is what we want. But if you're a provider that has low quality and high cost, you have a problem. So you won't reap the benefit. Um, and, and that's what we're moving to. We're moving to looking at our providers individually, looking at our patients by member, just as they do with Medicare Advantage plans. It's going to creep out of that Medicare Advantage, and it's going to hit us from other areas of payment. Um, and that's through risk adjustment as well. And I talk a little bit about diagnoses. Um, and I was explaining to someone this morning how you know, risk adjustment is basically looking at the severe, severity of the patient, looking at how sick that patient is and how we can best manage what that patient's needs are. And so if I'm provider A and I have a patient that has just diabetes, but I'm provider B and my patient has diabetes, congestive heart failure, and renal failure there, initially you can see that that patient with those three conditions has more severity or a higher severity. And sometimes those things aren't reported. So it's important that we are documenting those things and reporting those things. Um, and, and you would think, you know, those are easy things to, to report, but when it comes to the clinic, um, sometimes those things don't get reported appropriately. Um, another good example is patient with secondary neoplasm. You know, there I am, a patient, I had a primary neoplasm that has yet metastasized to a different site, it becomes a secondary neoplasm and needs to be coded that way. That's not always happening when it comes to um, some of our clinic visits. Um, and those things matter when it comes to how we're going to get paid in the, in the future. Uh, so they're looking at those things and they're indicators that we're going to have to follow and ensure we're meeting the need to be able to reap the benefits of that payment. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, yeah, and and so all of this, this kind of speaks to, and there's a link to Sharon's complete article there. Uh, I don't think it's behind the sign-in or anything, so you can go read that. <clears throat> and it really, you know, speaks to exactly what we wanted to talk about this week. So let me, um, let's see. Oh, here, John Paul, make it a comment, says, one thing I'm coming across as far as hospital-owned physician groups is that very few clinical coders are well-versed in HCC coding. I, I, yeah, I, I've kind of gotten that idea. I, ideally, the physicians and coding staff should both understand that. Right, and I think that, uh, Sharon, that's one of the examples you gave, right? Absolutely, About absolutely. And, yeah. and I don't think it's always, and I agree, Paul, you're absolutely right. It is, we, we're not. Coders don't code by HCC. Um, we code, you know, most of the time if we're in a hospital, of course, we're going to try to get the MCC and CCs. Um, but there are HCCs that apply to the hospital. But when you think mm -hmm. of clinics, sometimes we have coders that don't even know coding rules. So uh, they're, they're not real sure that we can code an ostomy status for a patient that comes to the, to the clinic that might have diarrhea 
are we going to also add that code for the ostomy status? Not always. Um, mm. So I do agree. It, it has a lot to do with our our ability to be able to hire those qualified people because, as I always say, our physicians are coding. Uh, and, and their rules are wrapped around that that aren't always applied because that's happening. Yeah. But is this Karen, is I this want to point out that a lot of the HCC issues that I see are, mm -hmm. uh, is just basic. The documentation in physician clinics is the templates are not as robust as they may be in-house. And so, mm -hmm. therefore, you may lose the entire opportunity in the electronic medical record to be even able to capture that. There's no, um, there may not be the the criteria there to put all that. Um, mm -hmm. Generally, they auto populate some of these things from prior visits, and mm -hmm. so there's quite a lot of the system that we used to do on paper that may be missing. So I agree with John Paul that the physician and the coders need to know it, but I also would like to put in there that information technology has to be part of that to make sure that mm -hmm. what your end deliverable you need to get to that point is actually built. Mm -hmm. And I'm finding more often than not when I audit things and I'm missing something, it's because the system didn't have the capability of recording it. Oh, that's a great point, too, Bill, because some of it's about establishing the relationship between diagnosis to be able to capture them properly. So is something within my template or within my system not allowing me to appropriately document that um, relationship? I, I think that's a very positive point. Hopefully, with this agreement that just came about with CMS and these three major vendors, I guess you guys have heard about that, um, Cerner, Epic, and I'm not sure who the other vendor is where they've all agreed to make system interoperable. Yeah. So hopefully we can have some better information that's being put out there. But, you know, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I have a bridge for sale, too. Um, <laughs> uh, here, okay, John Paul commenting that physicians are hamstrung by the 95 and 97 guidelines, which were designed in a time of handwritten documentation. 20 years later, physicians still aren't capturing the, their thought processes, and I agree that EHR systems weren't designed for HCC. Yeah, I totally, uh, I, I totally yeah. agree with that. And, and, and I guess you're this, talking about E&M level, John Paul. Yeah. And what uh, I, I was just going to ask, Bill and Sharon, what, what do you what do you do if you want to if you want to check and see if this is if this is a problem that exists in your system, like what John Paul is talking about, whether you know oh, you've got well, one group that you know doesn't understand HCC. Yeah, and I'd be interested in what Bill says, but you know, first of all, <laughs> we we got to know what this stuff is. We, you know, I, I've been to several meetings lately where HCCs come up and people are like, well, what's that? And, and the complexity there also comes in, well, they don't really understand how it's affecting their payment because guess what? We have the contract system once again, as we all talk about. I know Dr. Hirsch and Dr. Myerson and everyone kind of gets on that back bandwagon where we're not in the conversation, and Bill and I talk about it all the time. So they don't really know how their contract is built. So as I was saying last week, one particular hospital, there is incentive based on risk um, adjustment factor built in their contract that they had no idea about. So mm -hmm. first we got to educate ourselves about these mm -hmm. different systems and how they impact us as a hospital or as a system. And then after we figure that out, look, take a closer, deeper dive into your documentation where Bill and John Paul are coming from. Have an audit. Have someone come in there and look to see where you are from your HCC risk adjustment perspective by patient, by provider. Identify where some of those deficits are. Is it related to documentation? Is it related to templates? You know, is there something else that's a factor where we can't get a patient, where we know we have sick patients, why can't we have a score higher than one on these patients? You know, why yeah. are they just, just that base number? Um, because I know I live in, in the um, stroke belt. 
I know I'm going to have some sick people here. It yeah. it should be reflected to say that. What's your opinion, Bill? Well, I, I think so. I mean, I usually just start by going to their rounds, and and I'll even do just a quick knowledge check. Have you ever heard of HCC? Do you know how that may affect you? And if the answer, if I get like um, like deer in the headlights, I, I know I need to start at ground zero. Um, I need to talk to because these docs are really if you if you follow them around they're pretty overwhelmed. They've got patient concerns, they've got financial concerns, Absolutely. they've got work RVUs to get their payments, they've got uh, insurance companies saying no to commonplace things because the insurance company's just just an issue, and then uh, we're going to throw HCC and you know whatever in there, and they're just really trying to take care of the patients. Now they should have an understanding. So, but we're in an electronic world now. We should be able to set things up so that if we want an HCC documented, if there is one, um, then we need to make sure that those are at least soft stops, if not hard stops, um, to make sure that things are there. I mean, you have to look at from their endpoint. They're a provider. They're seeing more volume than they've ever seen. It's more complex care. It's more, it's getting, as we move through the Affordable Care Act and into some of the models we're going to talk about today, it's highly managed. We're way, way, we're going back 20 years now into this management and capitation and uh, fee-for-service kind of being squished down. So there's a lot coming at everybody. So this would be a great time to take a breath and say to them, do you even know what an HCC is? And if they say no, and how does that affect me, they're going to, their first response is it probably doesn't affect me. That's the coders. Well, no, it isn't the coders. You've got to get it there in the first place. So mm. there is some of the stuff that you have to then audit the template to the outcome. Now, I still say the people that dictate have better control over their outcomes than they do in an electronic templated system because they're trying to use the best smart phrase or the best template and nothing with a patient really ever is the same. There's some generalities like 97, 95 yeah. guidelines, but as John Paul just pointed out, they don't, it's hard to get all that. So those that dictate or have free narratives, they tend to do a better job at getting all these things across because they're thinking that way. Um, those that are very dependent on templates or, sh or smart phrases or, or whatever it is that gets them there quicker, um, they're going to they're gonna have a harder time with this. But I would start with, do you even know what this is? And in, in an integrated delivery system, these people have practice managers or something like that that you can start with. And so it's a great place um, to just say, hey, are you aware of this? Because you're going to need to know. We do a lot with... Um, updating them on the environment, you know, what, what contracts are changing, what, um, what is the government doing. Um, so we spend mm -hmm. a lot of time teaching their practice managers about the environment that they're providing the care in. So it, it's, you need to let them give care, and they need to have enough of an understanding to make sure that they document what it is they did. But if you keep going at them day after day, did you know this, did you do that, it's going to be difficult. They're going to just kind of get overwhelmed and be done with it. Yeah. Yeah. And there's and, a, um, you know, there's go. there's about over what thirteen thousand, I think it is, eight HCCs. Um, and definitely, we need to identify things that we are seeing in our area that pertain to us. Um, to educate on, um, I think it's great when we have the broad knowledge, but. I think we we're going to have to get involved in this as a group within an institution and and that's why I talk about ambulatory CDI a lot. Um because there are things that yeah, we can easily know, but there are things that are outside the norm um that can be impacted by having a good process. Mhm. Mm well, and there's uh there's uh, Dr. Hirsch just put in a uh, Ron Hirsch put in a link to an article that's about how um, there's yet another whistleblower case who are alleging Medicare Advantage fraud because they're, you know, they're saying certain things in order to get higher CCs oh, yeah. and more money. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, and uh, you know, and that's always going to be a problem. People do that with MCCs and CCs now. Sure. 
Sure. We, we're just yeah. not looking at it the, the same way as they're scrutinizing uh, the Medicare Advantage program. And I do think there's probably a lot of inappropriate capture, but I also think there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of um, misunderstanding when it comes to, to HCCs and capturing things. Um, I think sometimes our payers are driving that because, yeah, guess what? That's their, you know, that's how they're surviving. Um, but it's really a loop system. You know, we're all just resharing money. <laughs> yeah, that, that's all it is. We we just keep well, it for a little while and pass it back. Yeah, and the okay. thing for the thing for me though is I keep looking at this and thinking, okay, well, the value based thing is bound to lead to um, more and more physicians thinking about just taking better care of of their of their patients. They won't have they won't be thinking anymore about you know, well, I need to say this so I get the highest payment. That's not going to apply anymore because you, you're you not going to get paid anymore by what you write in the documentation. This is the impression I have. So what you're going to be, what you're going to be most focused on is making sure that your patient stays well, gets well, stays well, and doesn't come back and make you spend, <laughs> frankly, make you spend more time on them, more time and money. Because, well, that is the know, goal. Mm-hmm. Patient yeah. health is, is the goal yeah. because you're looking at the patient individually. But, you know, HCCs are a part of many plans, not just Medicare Advantage. It's, it's a part of the new MIPS process. It's a part of the alternative payment modules with models with HCOs, patient-centered medical homes, bundled payment. Um, the new healthcare marketplace includes HCCs. Uh, HCCs are built around many things um, that are in, in turn related to quality initiatives. So when we speak HCCs, we're not only talking Medicare Advantage, we're talking many things because it's going to be our life now. We're going to have to yeah. show what's going on with our patients to be able to be reimbursed for that. Um, so it, it's going to be across the continuum, not just yeah. with Medicare, Medicare Advantage where it's lived for a very long time. I think we have learned a lot from that. Um, but with MACRA, we didn't talk about it a lot a couple of weeks ago, Ernie, but there is a grouper that's coming out with MACRA where right. they're going to group diagnoses um, by provider, and they're going to be able to determine from a statistical standpoint more about your patient on the Medicare side. Um, mm-hmm. So we're moving to a different, a different approach of how Medicare is going to look back at us with what they're going to give us for payment. Yeah, and I don't want anybody to think that I'm I'm accusing uh, physicians of being focused on money. But I, you know, m- to me, it's just a rec- it's just a recognition that you kind of have to be today with the way that you're the way that you're being audited and the way that you're, you know, the way that the con- the costs are being controlled. They're counting on they're counting on uh, the physician to put certain things in there. So you've got to think about it. That's not necessarily clinical, although I guess people can argue, yeah, it is very clinical. I mean, um, I know plenty of people who would argue that the documentation is certainly, Dr. Larry Weed would argue that the documentation is, you know, appropriate documentation and complete documentation is the practice of medicine. But anyway, I just don't want anybody to think I'm accusing anybody of anything. I just think it's a shame that the system has come to that point. Yeah, and here's somebody saying, what a a shame on providers that commit fraud, of course. In general, most physicians are not over-documented. Coding. Coding. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, think of HCCs Uh, like like this, and and I talk about this sometimes. You know, so now most of us have an, an inpatient CDI program. Yeah. And in that C- in- inpatient CDI program, um, the initial focus, we're looking at severity and complexity of those patients. And where did we go to find that? Well, we went to MCCs and CCs. And those MCCs and CCs actually showed higher severity and increased payment for that patient today. That's what HCCs are. It's just, in you know, it's a part of your inpatient visit. They are in HCCs that are inpatient, but it's also a part of your clinic visit. So in your clinic, when you're a provider and you're seeing, you know, 15 patients now where you used to could see 25 or 30, 
because of mm-hmm. the new EHR system, you want to be able to show what you're performing at that clinic. You want to show that, yeah, I'm treating the sicker of the sick versus the, hot, the doctor across the street, which he's probably mm. treating the sicker of the sick too. But that's what this is about, being able to truly accurate, um, accurately show what you're doing uh, in your clinic and being appropriately reimbursed for that. And we have to understand that now because it's going to impact us drastically in the future because it goes by year. So if you're a physician with a system, you're getting your paycheck probably, you're getting your incentives if you do higher than the goals that you've been set. Um, But if you are an independent physician out there trying to make it on your own, this is going to be very critical for you. Because this is going to be all about your bread and butter. Not only are you going to be able to charge for what you do, but guess what? That charge, those charges, that fee for service payment is going to be smaller, and you're going to have to show that with higher quality, and you're going to have to show that through the patients you treat. So it, it's just a different way of thinking. Um, I myself do not condone upcoding or fraud or anything inappropriate, but I do condone being reimbursed for what you do um, and showing what is actually going on with the patient. Uh, And that's what really this is about. This is the ultimate driver for it. And I think Paul, John Paul's statement I saw a few seconds ago, it has to do with interpretation of the rules, I think he said, um, Mm -hmm. is is where some of the problems are. And it's really as simple as that. And as I said, you know, our physicians are coding now. And, you know, shame on us um, for not putting more focus and more attention on our physician side of things because we focus on CPT, but really there hadn't been a lot of focus on that either except for EM level. Um, So we just got to shift our focus. The times are changing. Uh, the thinking is changing, and um, HCCs have stepped outside of Medicare Advantage, and it's about to become more of our daily process of billing. Yeah, and as we as we've been saying, you know, uh, these new models are here. This is not something that's coming in a few years. I mean, a lot of us look at things like macro, and we think, well, macro is coming along, and, you know, it'll be fully by, what, 2018 or something like that. Um, but here is, you know, here's here's the latest thing, you know, and I've got several articles here that I found. These are just things that came out in the last two days, okay? Uh, the administration is uh, is saying how, you know, well, they're at the 30% mark. Holy cow, how did that happen? Uh, I didn't think it was happening that fast. Uh, now, I admit I don't work in a hospital, but I talk to all you guys who do. Nobody's telling me a third of their reimbursement just got switched over uh, to uh, to quality. Well, base. And a lot of that is the bundled payment program. Right? Yes, right. Some of the, the new types of AC models, ACO models that have come out, all those are tied to value. And guess what is embedded in all those programs? HCCs and risk adjustment. They're embedded. Yeah. That's a part of your incentive for being in that program. Yeah. Uh, here's well, Dr. I mean, the Hirsch. management of risk is, sure. is the key to all of this, Sharon. I mean, if you're going to move to value, if you're going to move to population health or whatever, it's about managing the risk. And that was the key for the, the a Affordable Care Act to really begin, is to bring mm-hmm. everybody into the insurance venue so we, like other countries that have a single-payer system, know what our risk is. And up until the Affordable mm-hmm. Care Act, with so many underinsured or uninsured, we really didn't know very well with risk. So they added I-10 to that to be able to give it some granularity. We now have risk adjustments. We're moving. The train is left, and it's moving pretty quick. And it's yeah. essential that this risk adjustments and what have you and being able to manage your own risk um, is going to be key to making sure population health um, really takes off in a meaningful way, not just a medical home here and there, but as a standard, you know, that becomes a new benchmark of of management um it's not about 
this uh, payment for volume, it's now going to be about managing your patient in, the, in, in a way that's most cost effective. So, you know, maybe it's cheaper to send a home health nurse out twice a day to make sure that the congestive heart failure patient, you know, stays on their med and does need a bologna sandwich followed by some bouillon um, that, to get all that salt in them. You know, I think we're really looking at now a mindset change that has begun, and the administration mm-hmm. is very key. I mean, the article from The Hill that was a previous one, today was Wall Street. These these articles are well touted. Mm-hmm. Look at our changes. Look at what we're doing. So no matter who the next president is, this ship has left the station, and it's unlikely to change course. It, it's running. Mm-hmm. And there you yeah. see the 50% target by 2018. Yeah. 50% right. of your payment is going to be impacted by this. Right, right. And, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a comment made by uh, Dr. Hirsch saying that, you know, and this is actually really kind of a separate discussion. I don't, I don't think I agree exactly. He says the rules are crazy. If it takes a coder 15 minutes to calculate the code for a 10-minute visit, there's something wrong. I don't know that I agree with that. I, I tend to think of that as a cost of doing business. Now I, you know, I could I could have my opinion changed. However, I'm not I'm not being um, firm about that. But I don't know that I buy that. That's necessarily wrong. Um, I, I can see that it's frustrating, and it certainly affects uh, throughput. Uh, but I don't know. It, it may just be a um, uh, you know. And here's somebody saying, yeah, it's the time to actually code a 10 minute visit. Where's the AMA about all this? Uh, I don't know, yeah. I, well, so, that that leads up to something I talked to Ernie about, <laughs> not just cool. the AMA, but, you know, um, just just some of our other groups out there, physician groups or whomever. Um, I know AHEMA gets on board, but, you know, definitely we have to, to advocate for change mm-hmm. on our side. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with advocating uh, for that. I'm just, I guess I just feel like, you know, at the moment, it is a cost of doing business. That is that is the way it is. Uh, if we can fix it, then sure, why not? Uh, but I think, Ernie, it's very important that every provider know what their workflow is. I spend my day asking people, mm-hmm. what, what does your workflow look like? You know, where are those holes? And they're basic holes, you know, mm-hmm. Uh, somebody's going to have a procedure. We never bothered to get the off. Um, somebody's coming in as an add-on. We never ben- got benefit eligibility. Um, somebody comes in, and I'm going to I'm going to leave that record. I'll chart on that tomorrow when it never gets done. Um, so uh-huh. it, it, it's very important that every provider, practice manager, hospital they they really have to almost visio their workflows because some of these workflows may yeah. have been adopted from prior periods, and you're actually causing the concern where you may have already remediated. You may be having a new process is actually undoing it. So I see a lot of these things going on, and when I get right down to it, they how, how does somebody know they have to do this? Well, it's hearsay. So it's important that, I mean, in business, in banking, in defense, the airline industry, they don't suggest, well, we kind of know how we're going to get to Singapore from Atlanta. They have a very specific workflow and checklist that they follow every single time. I understand healthcare involves an emotional science and a patient, but there are basic steps that, that never, ever should be forgotten. They have to happen 100% of the time. We do very well with that. Um, to prevent never events in OR times out and things like that. But do we really take that same degree um, throughout our our whole day, our whole provision of care? And I think that that's, that's kind of the some of the theme, that we're not going to yeah. just pay on volume to increase your reimbursement. We're going to have to make sure there's some sort of process um, there to make sure that that outcome occurs consistently. Exactly. Well, mm-hmm. One of the things one of the things that we wanted to point to was because uh, a, a Bill was telling me he'd just been to some meetings with their their Medicaid uh, group in uh, there in North Carolina, and so that made us start looking for things about Medicaid that were going on. I wanted to share with you this next slide. This is a this is a group that I subscribe to 
on LinkedIn, and I get an email every week from uh, the, the guy who runs this group. Excuse me. Uh, and uh, so, I, but I, I recommend uh, for everybody if you if you're not on LinkedIn, well, you know, go get on it. Uh, if you are, go look for this group and uh, join it. It's it's you know it's free. It's open to join. It's called Mostly Medicaid, uh, and it's a it's about he has some very entertaining stuff he writes every week about some of the strangest things going on in Medicaid around the country, and that's pretty much all he focuses on. So it's Medicaid related issues, and it started you know so that's just something for you to go uh, to go look at, and I and I recommend. And then there's you know so we Bill sent me this article. And we started looking into all this. Okay, so here is, these are 11 health systems that are in North Carolina. Wake Forest is part of it. Uh, Carolina's uh, uh, health system is a part of it. Sharon knows about them because she did so much work for them for so long. And what they're doing is they are now creating, and North Carolina didn't want to, if I remember right, they weren't sure whether they were going to expand Medicaid. Well, I, I guess they are. And this is part of the way that they're doing it. They've got some very, uh, very new ways of of switching to uh, and reforming Medicaid. Uh, and and part of that is because there's so much more happening in Medicaid. And look at this. Then there's a couple of articles I found that we were talking about interoperability, which you know to me is like that's the first thing that needed to happen. But of course it's going to be the last thing because the government is involved and said this is what we we're going to do before anybody did it. Um, but it's starting to happen uh, with, like Sharon, you were saying, you know, yeah, there was an article a couple of weeks ago about the big EMR vendors uh, having some agreement with CMS saying they're going to try and make interoperability work. I don't know how that's going to work. But well, here that, that came CMS out of DOD, though, Ernie. That came out okay. of that, that whole DOD bid where there was no interoperability. It's come out. It's, it's been a very salient point within the VA system and their ability to take care. So that was part of that VA debacle. Interoperability on different platforms is, is amazing. It's very difficult. Mm. Even within, if you own a system, a brand name system, a McKesson, a Meditech, an Epic, even you and your next door neighbor that owns the same system could could be very, very different and not be able to connect. So I think right. that, that, that the whole goal of the Affordable Care Act it, and meaningful use and everything was to, to really provide a system where people could could be able to receive quality care. And what we're finding is these systems are just a bunch of, of dots on a line that don't always connect. And every time there's a gap, there's another chance for a patient a quality factor uh, to fall short. Um, there's yeah. an actual gap for a patient to suffer harm. So I yes. think we have to look at where are these gaps? How is it? How are these systems and their interoperability contributing to that? I think the risk. Uh, I think all this risk stuff is going to require that we're going to be able to look at other people. And that's so. When we look at Medicaid, it, it's it's surprising to me that Medicaid is marching on as quickly as they are because they their state programs. And they're coming up with more novel ways to bite at the apple. Medicare's kind of stuck in stone. We're going to follow this, and we're going to try to make a patch um, on fee-for-service and try to keep patching it until it gets to be something else. Um, Medicaid's in the States, they're actually looking at you know, partnering with their providers and saying, look, we can't carry this burden anymore, so let's work yeah. out something we can. I mean, yeah. it will not be no, – nobody will be happy. Okay, we just have to get that through our heads that nobody right. will well, ever and, want and, and, and part of this is, I mean, this is not an unusual problem, okay? Uh, in, in, in the world of uh, uh, digital databases and um, uh, any kind of a digital business model, I know because I did this for about 20 years, uh, every time you tried to combine two systems, you had a problem. Now, yes, you can make a black box piece of software that goes in between and that will make them work. It will make them mesh. The trouble is you have to come up with definitions for things that everybody can agree on. And that's the trouble. Now, first name, you and I can agree on what a first name is. And what you call it, there's not a lot of things to call it. But when you start to get to all these diagnoses, now how many diagnoses are there? Thousands, tens of thousands, and you know, in ICD-10, there's you know, 
what, 175,000 or something. So the problem is, what do you call it? And what do you call it uh, over in that country? What do you call it across the street? You can't get it. I mean, I just went with my sister to the hospital earlier this week, and, uh, you know, they couldn't even find a document because what they were calling it in one building was they were calling it something else in another building, and nobody could find it because they weren't in the right building. So it's a, you know, that's a problem that it's it's not unusual, it's not unique to healthcare, but it's some and it can be solved. It can be solved. So, um, okay. So then, okay. So that's all the stuff. But maybe it'll happen first in Medicaid. I don't know why it would be easier there or can work there, but it seems to be that maybe where you want to start watching what's going to happen. Then there's this wrinkle. Uh, that I just saw this week. Now, I hadn't heard much about it. Uh, Bill seemed to be pretty familiar with it. It's the idea that, um, uh, you know, hospitals are starting to sign up and create what they call concierge care. In other words, it, it's, not, it's not insurance, uh, but it's, uh, you know, hey, you pay us so much a year, we take care of you. Uh, I'd heard of physician concierge type operations. I didn't know the hospitals were starting to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, so that was something that there's another wrinkle. I mean, you know. And this is, is that newer. Documentary? This is not new at all. Okay. There's well, national all right. health service in the United Kingdom, and then there's private national health service. Private national health service is nothing more than concierge care. Yeah. You get your yeah. own doctor. And we have a hospital in yeah. North Carolina that has done this actually for a couple of years. Yeah. Okay. Well, and then. Um, uh, you know, but there are people who are objecting to it. They're saying, "Oh, well, this is only going to this is going to favor the rich." I'm going, "Well, anything that has a price on it is going to favor the rich." So there's going to be different levels you can do. But anyway, that's my opinion. Then there's um, there was this article that I found that refers to a report uh, that you know after a year of the ACA, well, what's happening? Uh, and basically, what they're saying is that. Uh, if if the state expanded Medicaid, the doctors are seeing paying patients more uh, than they used to, which kind of sounds like, okay, well, isn't that obvious? Well, not really, because if you go look at the report, now, I've got a link to the report here. This is on the Aerolib um, Aorta Forum, so you can just click on that link. It'll take you there. You can download it there. I didn't want to put it. It's big. I didn't want to put it in the handouts today, so I posted it on Aorta. But anyway, that's where it is, and you can find the whole report there. And look at what, you know, I mean, some things here. We don't have a whole lot of time, so I'm not going to go through uh, the rest of this. But it's, you know, um, there are some surprising little conclusions that they find uh, in this. Uh, you know, basically saying that, hey, this is, this is working. This is kind of working well. Uh, even commercially insured uh, uh, patients, there are, you know, they're paying only slightly more. Uh, than they did in previous years, uh, although costs seem to be r rising. So I don't understand everything is going on, but here's some results. If you want to see somebody with, you know, statistical results about what's been happening, then go look at this report. Um, I wish I had more time to go through this. And then there's, you know, there's this happening. Uh, Ernie, CMS, again, I wanted to point out, I yeah. wanted to point out, the, can you go back to the first slide? This is about primary care. That ACA view really gets into primary care and the coverage and the low deductibles and the low co-pays. It does, yes, okay. did not speak at all to the high deductible plans with patient, right. patients having huge deductibles that they can't pay. You, you know, so mm -hmm. this is for primary care where there's a, there's there there's a benefits for preventative services there's low copays low deductibles i mean the worst you're going to get might be an ER visit but when you get into those high deductible plans and you have a significant illness this is this is not applicable this report does not address most of that and so i wanted to just kind of point that out there that there's a growing concern with the high deductible plans and the patient liabilities and moving that to bad debt and then write-offs and, you know, it, it's growing. It, it, it's a real yeah. problem. Um, yeah. And so, that brings up this, 
this point, um, Bill, you know, just speaking back on the HCCs for a second, HCCs are built into all these ACA plans. Every single one of them, they're about to have a big meeting at the end of the month to go over some things related to risk adjustment to see if they need to make some changes. But Mm -hmm. one thing you have to consider about that is that you get paid for that member. So if you're not showing the sickness of that member, how is that going to affect that Medicaid plan? It will not get the dollars it needs to survive. So that is another reason why what we code is important. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then uh, after this is, uh, we get, here was this article that just came out as well. Again, this is all stuff that happened in the last couple of days. Uh, CMS is now offering states uh, to be able to get information sharing gap in Medicaid. In other words, this goes back to the idea that they're going to try and make this happen in Medicaid. They're going to try and make the interoperability happen in Medicaid, and they're going to foot 90% of the bill. So the states can ask for funding, and CMS, you know, if they come up with a project, CMS will pay for 90% of it. I think that's going to move some states to go after this. Uh, I think this is really great. Uh, great news, um, and and that will happen. Then I'm going to kind of try and move quickly through these, but you guys stop me if you see something you want to talk about for a minute. But um, here's where the governors in Florida now. I don't remember. And you guys, there's some people on the call who I think are in Florida. Did they expand Medicaid or not? Um, John Paul might have that answer. Okay, so at any rate, this is where the governors. Uh, the nation's governors are asking, uh, oh, that's right, this one's not about Florida. This is, um, but this is the National Governors Association wrote to CMS and said, you know what, we, you're, you're limiting our ability to manage the managed care contracts, and they don't like that. Uh, they want to be able to still do that so they can finance Medicaid in the same way that they've been doing it traditionally. They don't get all the money from the Fed, of course. They've got to go outside and do it. Well, if they can't control the managed care contracts, the the payments uh, in those, then it's going to be very hard for them uh, to be able to manage the costs. And so they're, they're, again, they're trying to get it so that they get more control of the managed care contracts. Um, Okay, and then here's the one that's about Florida. Uh, they're they're trying to make it uh, so that yeah, with very narrow exception rule, otherwise restricts ability of states to direct expenditures through their Medicaid managed care contracts. Um, so again, I <laughs> I like this little poster they had. Do not let bureaucrats get between you and your physician. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that's going on. Now Florida has also been active because they passed some new bills. Or these are in their Congress. They passed at the House level. I don't know what the what the likelihood is that they go all the way. But look at what these are about: telemedicine rules for telemedicine. Uh, it's going to allow out-of-state doctors to use uh, telemedicine for people in Florida, clarifying whether that's legal or not. Uh, you're going to be able to contact directly with doctors or other kinds of providers for primary care. Without calling it insurance, in other words, that won't be it won't be uh, regulated as an insurance policy. Uh, and you know, here this one: advanced registered nurse practitioners and physicians assistants, the right to prescribe narcotics and other drugs. Wow, um, that looks big to me. I don't know if people are going to be jumping up and down about that. I'm not I'm not sure what that means. But look at all these things that are these changes are coming they're, they're along. Giving, they they are trying to I think that's a national trend Ernie. that's not just Florida. Um that's a okay. national trend to give the mid levels more latitude. Um in some cases it's good, but if we're already concerned about opiate prescriptions nationwide and how yeah, they're handled, right. and every, I, I don't know, adding another layer. Although I think a PA and an NP will probably be a lot more careful about prescribing those uh, than a physician because they really don't have the prescriptive authority of a physician. 
And so that yeah. may become – so, I mean, it's all kind of like growing pains here. What I'm seeing on the screen is growing pains. So setting the rules for telemedicine for out-of-state doctors, we see this all over the country with uh, psychiatry, where there's not mm-hmm. enough uh, mental health providers. And so mm-hmm. uh, maybe we're using a Virginia telehealth firm to, to look at our patients in, in, in South Car- or North Carolina or their adjoining state. So – Right. A lot of this is a regional issue, especially in the frontier states. You're going to see that. So this mm. is this is not new. I think where it really got crazy was there was some suggestions of using intercontinental telemedicine, meaning Australia's up when we're in bed. Somebody gets sick at two in the morning, the telemedicine could go out of the country to uh, a U.S. based firm. I think there's a lot of these questions now that we just we just have to look at with some scrutiny. Um, yeah. The telemedicine will move forward. I mean, yeah. I use yeah. it exclusively. Every time I'm unwell, I'm not going to a doctor. I'm absolutely not going to the ER. But that telemedicine guy <laughs> comes on my computer. I can multitask. I can get my prescription for my strep throat along with getting my Excel spreadsheet done. So it, it works for me, but I think that's a, <laughs> I think that's a growing thing. Uh, it's certainly going to be a growing thing with the elderly if they can use the computer um, for population management. I don't think I would quite have the same motivation or knowledge uh, going on telemedicine that you would, Bill. So, uh, but anyway, yeah. So, but I can see I can see how that's you know. I mean, I've heard people talk about it even on the show before. You know, they need to get these rules set for telemedicine because it's a growing thing. So once again, you know, more things that are changing. So given all that and the fact that we're down the last five minutes, so then. What do you do uh, if we're going to do all this? Is something like um, this thing in your future, like the Medicaid plan in North Carolina? Here is uh, there's a link here. You can go find these links. I did not include all this in the handouts because no need for they're in there. You can find the uh, you can find the uh, find the article from that link. They've got a great PowerPoint here. That's what it looks like, and it talks about this. Now, again, I, I picked this slide to show you from the PowerPoint because look at this. Twelve months, transition complete. Oh, my. It's here, folks. Uh, we're not, uh, you know, we're not, we're not, it, it's not years off, okay? It's pretty close to happening. And then there are these, you know, here are the two talking points. Bill, I know that you wanted to to mention these two. Uh, about innovations and, and timing. Well, yeah, I, I think that one of the things that really was impressive is the state legislature in their debates, they actually said and continued to say about the innovation in the reform model is they need to switch from fee-for-service to an in, where there's little incentive for quality and it's just a volume-based driven thing towards yeah. health plans that are prepaid that has value. So if they're going to give you a lump sum of money to these 11 people, they give you a lump sum of money and you have to manage all that risk, you might you may handle that patient differently. Mm, so yes. that was the one thing, and then the, the continued implementation over the next three years. The point there being is it's a very aggressive timeline, and right. I think we're starting to see states and even the nation are, are on a pretty aggressive timeline with all this. Right. Okay, and so then we get down to our final point of the show. You know, It's time to control your risk. Uh, and to do that, you're going to have to be able to see your data like you've never seen it before. Now, I honestly don't think many hospitals are ready to do this, not even the big ones with lots of money and lots of tools and all that, because their their cost accounting systems are not really set up to do this very well. Uh, that's that's a personal opinion, but that's, that's the way I see it. Uh, and it's not just about finance. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be, Everything you've got to you've got to be able to tell what your costs are, or you're you're not going to be able to control anything. Um, and it's not you know, the payments are not going to be like they were before. And like I said, you're going to want to be able to do, uh, you know, some people would call it cookbook medicine, but it's like, well, what works in your hospital? What are you finding the best? All of this is evidence-based medicine, right? Uh, it's what works and what doesn't. Uh, And you're going to have to be able to do that. The only way you're going to be able to figure that out is to be able to see your data as never before. So how do you? And I want to point out that that one, Ernie. That that's that's key. That's key to all this. There has to be transparency. 
you yeah. have to be able to understand your practice pattern. You have to be able to understand where to make those changes. It has to be agile. It cannot be something that takes six months to build a new platform. It has to be common sense. And we are creating systems at this point to get data in. But those systems that get data in are requiring add-ons or whatever to try to get data back out. So it's and very a way we can this. aggregate it. Yes. Yes. There's, it's yeah. a very key at this point that if you're a hospital system or a physician practice that's large, you really need to be looking at that next iteration of data analytics. Is it predictive analytics? Is it machine analytics? Is it rule-based analytics? Is it a combination of all three? You know, what is that, what is that secret sauce that's going to make you yes. in that competitive nature? Um, how right. do you know when your readmissions, if you go to this North Carolina model and you've got to prevent the readmissions, you know, when, when, when does that become the, the trigger? What's going to cause that trigger? You know, um, is, is it snow where they can't get their medicine? Is it rain? Is, you know, what are all these social triggers too? So all this data has to be transparent and it has to be agile. So we're starting to see finally hospital systems invest huge amounts of money in, in their data analytics. Yes. Yeah. And that is what, you know, and that's, uh, I mean, that's beyond what most of you on the call today, you know, can get very involved in. But you can certainly argue, you know, for that kind of things. And the other ways that, you know, I asked Bill and Sharon, you know, well, what do you do if you're not, you know, the decision maker on stuff like that? Well, you better stay up on everything that's happening. And how do you do that? It's by getting active and, like, go, you know, make sure you're involved uh, with the Medicaid group, you know, for this, for the, for the state, get involved in anything about that, so you can pay attention to what's going on, so you're up on it. You can be a representative for your hospital, or your department, or your boss, or, you know, whatever. Uh, Stephanie and, was just saying, go ahead, go ahead, Sharon. And you know, I was gonna just add, and make sure you can wear different types of hats. And when yes. I say that, you know, make sure that you can wear your denial hat when you got to wear your denial hat. Make sure that you're focusing on that contract and inappropriate things that are happening with that contract when you need to have that hat on, as well as the denial. Push back on that plan or that, you know, um, Medicare Advantage, whatever it is. Push back mm -hmm. on them when you have to wear those hats. But when it comes to the hat where you're looking at, quality and, and financial success of your practice, institution, hospital, wherever, make sure you can wear that hat and you take advantage of all those opportunities. Because if you get bogged down with focusing on this payer is so bad and I hate that payer, you can't relish the opportunity that you can get from that payer. And, so and I, I would kind of thrown something else in here too, Sharon. Let us not forget we're here to give patient care. What about the patient? Right. What is the outcome? Well, that's what it's about. Work? It's about the member. Yeah, you're right, Bill. And so, as we're we're struggling with all this, think about how we would want to be treated. Um, think about us, our parents as patients. Is this what is this right? Um, so we're starting to see a lot more patient involvement in many, many, many of these Medicaid decisions. It's probably not as much as it should be, but it's a start. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it, you know, uh, and, you know, so these are just some suggestions that we have for, you know, if you want to stay up on it, you want to be a part of it, you want a seat at the table, you're not going to get a seat at the table if you're not up on what's happening. So go out and, and make sure that you're, you're paying attention. Uh, get involved in the State Hospital Association. I have Stephanie Daniels, you know, suggesting that there's going to be more payer hospital uh, affiliations just so you can get your hands on the payer's data. I, I like that idea. You know, why not? If you, if you can, plus it gives you a, a door to the payer, uh, somebody you can talk to who's not going to be, you know, an adversary all the time. That stuff is all important to have. Pay attention to the innovative plans that are going on everywhere. Uh, and, you know, as they were just saying, Bill and Sharon just saying, make sure you're in touch with your managed care contracting team. And just your, you know, your, your 
pay your contracting team, whoever's doing all that, just stay in there. That's that's what we've got. Hey, you that's have to be tied to at do. the hip. You you have to be tied at the hip to manage care at this point. You absolutely yeah. positively because these things are changing so quick, and it's very important that you understand and embody those contracts. Right. So it's here. The time is now. And just like Napoleon said, you know, uh, think about it all you want, but when the time for actions arrive, go to action. Get in there. So that's all we got for this week on the show. I do want to remind you that we will, uh, the show we were going to do today about senior data like CMS does, we're going to do that later in the month of March. Uh, uh, I am still working on these other subjects as well, uh, ROI, uh, tactics to fight payer contracts, and uh, Dr. Perugia and I are putting together a Top Gun audit lot of school case study uh, to be able to show everybody how we, you know, what we did and, and how it worked out. So um, that's all. We're over time as usual uh, a little bit, uh, but we will be back next week live Friday, March 11th, with a special presentation about I'm not sure what. So watch for my email announcements. Thanks to everybody for participating. We had a great, uh, great participation in the chat box today, and of course, thanks very much to my co-hosts, Sharon Easterling and Bill Mom, who are always, of course, uh, a big help, and it's great to hear what they've got to say about these subjects. So, And, of course, we want to thank our sponsors. They are the ones who make these broadcasts possible. Health Law Partners, Medlinks Cost Containment, Aerolib Healthcare Solutions, Recovery Analytics, and the CCMA. So watch for my emails about the March 11th show. Share the links to our show with your colleagues and friends. And the last thing I want to share with you is my favorite image of the week. This comes from the guy who wrote The Little Prince. His name was Antoine de Saint-Exprie. The time for action is now. It's never too late to do something. So thanks very much, everyone. Have a great weekend. We will see you next week when it's finally Friday. Bye-bye.